Yeah, a couple things. Um, just I just want to briefly touch on like the geo um, SF plus like limits interaction um, that Ryan S and I were talking about in the Slack channel um, a bit. And then I think since I got like in some extra time, I might actually just go over the section with date time. Um, it has like the same concepts of like the, the parts of the limits and scales or the parts of the scales uh, that you can tweak around, but just for a date time data. Um, and then I guess maybe if I have time a little bit more on transformations. Uh, but yeah, that's roughly it. Um, I hope y'all aren't too you know, sick of me because I think it's my like third week in a row presenting. Um, but um, yeah, uh, so I guess the first thing uh, that I wanted to talk about that was uh, really interesting when I first saw this was um, if you didn't get to see, oh, is that going to mess me up if I, no, oh, I'll open it in a new tab. Um, can everyone see the, uh, I think it's loading. The Twitter page, like the, the thread. Okay, yeah. So uh, someone made a post that was like, if you create a map um, in ggplot, so it's just going back to the map chapter, like if the data is uh, like an SF object um, or like ST object, I'm actually still not sure the difference between the two. But if it's like a um, like a like a spatial geometry object, uh, like a special type of a data, um, and you pass it into ggplot, and then you just add a layer called geom SF, then that prints like a map um, and like polygons. Um, and then what this person was saying is that if you use scale like X, Y continuous and set the limits in there, then it will just zoom in without like messing up the connection of the dots. Um, and so this was like surprising to me when um, I first saw this because like if you do this with regular polygons um, and so if the data was just like a data frame of points, like each row is a point um, and then you set the group of all the observations as like the same group. So like by default, it does that, or you can explicitly set it by setting group to like a constant, like one um, or like minus one is what ggplot uses internally. Um, then it will create a polygon that connects all the dots. And if you change the limits such that you leave out some of the points, then it will change the calculation of the polygon. And so if the limits exclude some of the points, then the, the, the path of the polygon will only include the points that are in the viewing range. Um, if you cut that out with like scale X, Y continuous um, and the limits argument. Um, and so that's what we expect, but then we don't see that from GM SF. It just zooms in um, and it doesn't like force the recalculation of the polygon edges. Um, and so I was looking into that. So Ryan actually made a really nice reprex, reproducible example. Um, with like a toy data frame where we have vertice, six vertices, um, goes from 0 0.11 to 1, 2, 2, 1, uh, I guess this is 3, 2 here, and then 6, 5, and then back down to 1, 1 here. Um, and so this is like a polygon that gets drawn with this path. Um, and so with geom polygon, when you have made something like this, and you set the scale such that you exclude a point like a vertice, then it changes the calculation of that polygon. And so this is exactly the same kind of syntax that we saw with the geom SF example, except this time we don't get a zoom, we get the default sensor effect, which we saw like last week when we just set limits and we don't do anything else with the scales. Um, and this, the same thing happens, not just for geom polygon, but also geom path. Um, and so geom polygon is essentially just geom path, but then you fill in the intersecting areas. Um, and you see that you don't get this line from one one that connects one one to like six five, something like that, because it's out of range. Um, and then we have this example of the geom SF style of plotting a polygon. Um, we haven't set the limits here. So the, they're being smart about it. And all of the vertices are included within the range. If you add the limits, then as we saw in that tweet example, I'm actually going to zoom in a bit, um, we get uh, just like a clipping of the, like a visual area clipping. Um, and it doesn't remove that vertice from the calculation of the polygon. Um, and so uh, we see one thing I noticed about this is that like if you use geom SF, what happens is that ggplot adds a chord SF by default. 
Um, so if you also didn't know, like if you just had like a regular ggplot um, with just like the regular kind of geoms and not like SF style geoms. Um, so for example, just like this geom polygon call, what happens internally is if you don't specify a coordinate yourself, then you will just get chord Cartesian. Um, and the same thing kind of thing is happening here when we use geom SF with um, SF object, except when we use geom SF with an SF, SF object as the data, then what it does is it actually adds a chord SF, um, which can also be added explicitly with the function called chord SF. Um, but it's a type of a coordinate system that inherits from the Cartesian coordinates, but it has some other things going on for it. Um, and I think this is where uh, we're seeing this different behavior uh, with out of bounds handling, uh, such that if you set uh, chord FS explicitly, then you're just making the default explicit. And so you get the same thing. Um, and then when you are setting limits in the scale XY, that is essentially the same as if you were setting the limits inside chord SF. Um, and then if you try to use uh, like a geom SF uh, ggplot with the chord like chord Cartesian, then it doesn't work. It has to be with chord SF because that is the kind of, the this chord SF like supports, or chord SF has coordinate systems that support um, the plotting of SF objects. Um, is like my understanding of it. I haven't gotten a chance to look through it very deeply, but the idea is that if you use geom SF with SF objects, it will automatically attach chord SF, which changes some defaults for out of bounds handling. Um, and in fact, you can't really override this default. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna skip down here a bit. Uh, if we go back to our scale, let's continuous example. Um, and we, what we learned from the OOB section, the out of bounds section, if we use an out of bound handler or algorithm like sensor, which is also the default, right? So this would just turn the values that are out of range specified within the limits argument here into NAs. Um, even if you explicitly supply that, it doesn't change the behavior of how this gets plotted because chord FF, SF just kind of overrides that. Um, and that's actually what you will often see is that chord, the coordinate uh, ggproto often overrides uh, things for the scale ggproto. Um, and so if you, if you specify things in both places, uh, then I think ggplot will just go with the one specified in chords. Uh, so if you have scale x continuous and you set limits there, and you also set limits in chord Cartesian x lim equals, uh, then I think it will go along with the chord Cartesian one. Um, so this is, I think, what we're seeing here. Chord uh, S or yeah, chord SF has defaults for out of bounds handling that you can't override with the OOB argument inside scale XY functions. Um, but a uh, neat thing is they actually do have, so the chord SF does have its own like limits handling, um, like kind of like out of bounds handling, but it just has nice defaults for um, the, the kind of thing that you want to do um, with respect to setting limits of a plot. Uh, that's speci specially designed for handling uh, like plotting of maps. Um, and so there's actually this one uh, method or one, yeah, one method for specifying limits for uh, plotting SF objects uh, that you can specify with the argument limbs method inside chord SF. Um, there's a couple of them, I think they're outlined here. Uh, this is a help page for like all the SF related functions inside like like base ggplot2. Um, and so there's chord SF, geom SF, geom SF text labels, etc. cetera. Um, if you go down to the limbs method argument, it will give you some options. Uh, one thing that I found kind of nice about it um, is that there's this option called geometry B box. So B box is like a bounding box. And so if you set limbs method to this, then it will just automatically adjust the range of the plot such that all the geometries in your data can be shown within that, within your like viewing area. Um, and so this automatically sets the limits of your plot so that you can see um, everything, everything's in view. Um, and this will override again, this is a plot that we made with like an explicit scale X continuous limits equals call that set the limits from zero to four, one to four. Um, but if we set geometry B box, then it overrides that and then it gives you a limit from one to six. 
Um, and so again, the course can override a lot of the things that scales do. Um, and the reason why this is possible is because actually, um, if I scroll back up a little bit here, um, actually, if we look at like the underlying data for GOM SF, uh, then we'll actually not get like X and Y values. So we would have seen that if we draw for the polygon plot, like if we go look inside layer data, it will show us like six rows again, um, each corresponding to like a vertice and it would all belong to a same group. Um, but then for SF objects, you just get like a special column called geometry. And then you get some other like, you know, aesthetic related things. Uh, but the main data is in here. And what you'll notice is when you have limits or for the plot without limits set to zero to four, and for the plot that has the limits that presumably exclude the um, one of the vertices, uh, the underlying geometry is the same. So like the geometry, the value of the geometry column of the layer data is the same. It's just that one data that we passed in, which was uh, this one. So setting the scales didn't really change the data or like remove points from the data. Um, it just adjusts the viewing window uh, when you get to rendering time and then that's it. Um, it doesn't have consequences for calculations. Although I should add that actually um, this seems like the like not um, approved, not, yeah, like not suggested approach by the developers. So if you actually go into go back to the whoop, uh, documentation from, you know, all the, that, that contains all the SF related functions from ggplot. Uh, at some point when they talk about limits somewhere, um, there we go. Uh, they're like specifying limits via position scales. So that's like scale continuous um, or X and Y limb is strongly discouraged as it can result in data points being dropped from the plot even though they will be visible in the final plot region. Um, so what I think is being meant by this is that the scales could theoretically like take the data and then maybe like censor some data or squish some data. Um, and then you could, you might, and then that might happen like before the statistical transformation happens. So as we talked about like, um, you know, like OB squish that like squishes the outliers can also like squish the range of a box plot because like that has consequences for statistical calculations. And so that could happen. But then the reason why like this part exists, like even though they will be visible in the final prop region is I think because at draw time, the only thing that ggplot uses to draw the actual geometries are, is with the information in the geometry column. And that is like the same, regardless of whether you have limits that exclude some of the data or if you don't have any limits. Um, and so I think the geometry is what ggplot uses to draw the data, but then limits can kind of, you know, intervene at some point, and then that might cause like unintended consequences that are uh, end up being not visible. Um, so I think this might I I haven't looked at it very deeply, but I think this could happen. For example, if you were calculating like centroids, um, so you could imagine like you have multiple, you have like a polygon in mind, you want to calculate the center of the polygons. If you change the limits such that you're excluding one of the vertices that might have consequences for calculation of the centroid, but then the geometry will be drawn as if like all the vertices were present because the scales don't mess with the, like the actual like SF object um, that's being you know, stored in the special geometry column and not being messed around with internally. So yeah, so I think that's what's happening. Um, I have some things going on with internals, but this is, uh, stuff that you can run with like ggtrace to go into like debugger mode at the specific points where the scales take effect. Um, I won't demo that here, but um, I think this is a good point where like I introduce like another really nifty like debugging inspection kind of function. It's called layer grob. So we saw layer data as kind of like inspecting um, the transformed data uh, before it gets sent off to the rendering system. Um, and then layer grob is essentially the complement of that where layer grob is you take the data from layer data and then it's like the rendering system doing is like the rendering system doing its job to calculate um, and return like graphical primitives. So like rectangles and lines and points and stuff like that. So what we're doing here is essentially just grabbing um, our polygon uh, plot from before that had like the 
the like top right vertice removed. Um, and then we're grabbing the, uh, the graphical objects that are present for that geom polygon layer. Uh, and then we grab the first one, first, first, uh, gra first graphical object from that geom polygon layer because we only have one polygon. And then I'm just using patchwork rep elements here so that it's like, it just automatically has nice defaults for printing grobs. Um, otherwise, like you have to do some stuff with the grid package. Uh, but in any case, this is like the kind of thing that we see. Um, and then for SF, SF polygon without the limits set is like, it shows the full range of the data. And then if you set the limits, then the grob is essentially just like translated a little bit and then it's rescaled to fit the size of the panel. Um, and what you'll actually see is uh, between this grob uh, that's used for the SF plot without limits that like restrict the range of X. Um, and then this plot where you do have limits that restrict the range of X, the, there is no difference in how many vertices are being plotted. So you can actually go inside like the graphical object and then pull out the XY coordinates. Um, and then here are the XY coordinates. Um, if you recall from, I think we might've talked about it last, no, two weeks ago, but we definitely talked about it three weeks ago when uh, we were doing annotations. Uh, this unit called native is actually like another word for NPC or um, what is it called? Like normalized parent coordinates. Um, and so native is kind of the intuitive goes from zero to one kind of coordinate system. Um, and so you'll see that like we have one vertice starting at almost zero, which is here. And then we have some vertices going like almost to one. Uh, so for this plot, it's like here. And then the data, underlying coordinate data for this cutoff plot is here. And you'll see that we actually still have six vertices, except that the vertice that was at the top right now has coordinates that go beyond zero to one. So we have a point that's at 1.5 native units. So it's actually like, you know, like somewhere, like way past this point, it exists, but then we just don't see it because it's not part of the zero to one uh, viewing window. That's also called a viewport. Viewport is ranges from zero to one in both coordinates. Um, but yeah, and so like we're plotting the same object, but then it's just, we're, we're zooming into different parts of it. Um, the last vertice or the top right vertice exists, but then we just don't see it. It's just plotted. Um, outside of the viewing window or the viewport. Uh, yeah, that was uh, some stuff on the Geom SF things. Any thoughts <laughs> on this? I'm actually not super familiar with the like spatial side of things. So I hope this is a correct interpretation. Notice in the documentation for the limbs method it says it has no effect when the default CRS is null and that you get different things when you have a nonlinear CRS, like something centered around the North Pole. Mm. So that, that makes sense if you, if you think about a view centered on the North Pole where um, the, um, the lines of latitude are circles and you wanna clip that to somehow to a square, you have to, well, it's not clear what that means. And so that's a different limbs method give you some control over, over what that means for the clipping. Um, and I imagine that's the circumstance where you might get things appearing that you don't expect when you, and when you have a very nonlinear projection. Yeah, that's that here. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah, I haven't explored all these options. They say, they say cross is the default. Geometry B box is the one I showed. This one makes the most sense to me because you're just including all the, like all parts of the geometry inside the like bounding box. Um, but yeah. Right, but it's, you see it says when this whole parameter has no effect when default CRS is null, which is the case with the examples that you've been showing today. Oh, so I have to set this, where is that? This to something first, is that it? Um, well, you, you need to use some, yeah, some projected data, mm. which I, yeah, you could uh, set that to something else. I see. Yeah, I don't think the toy data has 
projection information on no, it? No, like, I don't think yeah, so either. It definitely does not. Mm. But yeah, I think that might be worth exploring. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I take the, the world map and project it to um, look from the North Pole and then experiment with the different um, boundary methods, the limbs methods. Could you also specify a CRS for the toy data? Uh, you could. I'm not sure what would be a meaningful value. Yeah. Because you want to then have data that makes sense in the projection that you've defined. Um, that's something I would want to try to do on the fly. Yeah, that's yeah. too beyond me, but I will, I will go explore that. The like North Pole, uh, testing things, testing coordinate systems around the North Pole sounds like a very interesting idea. Um, but yeah, this was the Geom SF um, aside. Um, and I think I had a little more stuff about um, daytime. Uh, I just felt like maybe I should just cover this section since like there was a section on it, I kind of skipped that. Um, it's actually not a lot. I think it just introduces like new functions, but the way they work is pretty much the same. Um, and so uh, for working with daytime uh, variables, if you want to manipulate the breaks of daytimes, um, I think the book said the most like common uses of this is uh, setting like the intervals at which the breaks are specified. Um, and you can just do that by like, you know, just plain English, um, but like 25 years or like 10 days. Um, and I think um, internally date breaks, this argument passes this to another one of the break underscore functions we saw. Um, so in this case, uh, date breaks is essentially the same as breaks equals scales break width. And then that argument, which specifies the uh, length of the interval between the breaks. Um, and this all both happens inside scale x date. So scale x date, like all the other continuous scales, um, have this break argument. Um, but then they also have date breaks argument, which, you know, it's kind of, this is like an, that's like an alias of this, essentially. Um, but you just get kind of a shortcut with the date breaks um, argument of uh, scale x date. Uh, yeah, and so uh, we can also like move this logic outside of a ggplot like we saw before. So essentially all of these like helper functions like breaks underscore or labels underscore um, are again what are called function factories. So the output of these functions are themselves functions that take like a range, um, like the range of the data and then like makes, you know, multi-length vectors out of them that represents the breaks um, that you're gonna use for the plot. Um, and so the book also has an example of going from 1900 to 1999. You set, you create a breaks like function uh, that breaks for by every 25 years. Uh, this function takes this range, and then it will return dates from 1900 to you know 2000 uh, with 25 year intervals, which includes the range of the data, or like which includes the range that you supplied it. Um, there's this. Also this argument called the offset inside breaks width um, for date times. It seems like offset can't have like character values. So like I tried like offset equals one year, uh, which would presumably like start the breaks like one year later than where like the lower range of the data goes. Um, it doesn't do that. It can only accept like numeric. Um, and so in context of date times or in context of dates, uh, it's one day. I actually haven't tried this with date times, which can go all the way down to like the second unit. Um, I'm not sure what offset, like a numeric offset value means there, uh, but at least for uh, date objects, uh, offset is only numeric and it's uh, in units of days. Um, and so we started from like January 1st um, of 1900. If we offset by 31 days, then we move into February. So now it starts from February 1st, and then it goes, uh, the breaks are for every 25 years after that. And then it always breaks on February 1st. Um, and this isn't from the book, but if you wanna calculate the offset, there's, uh, if, 
if you have if you supply like a vector of date objects and then call diff.date, or I think it might just, you might just be able to do it with diff. Um, this might just be syntax for like the diff generic defined for the date class. But in any case, you can call this diff.date or diff function on a vector of date objects. And then it will return you uh, like how many days um, of difference there are. I think you can also specify the units, but the default is 31. So then if you wanted to offset by like a month, um, and start from 1900 February 1st instead of 1900 January 1st, um, then you can do something like this to figure it out um, like programmatically. Um, and this is just how diff time objects are printed. So uh, this is just like not the actual value. This is how it prints in the console. If you want to get the actual value, you would call s.integer um, on this output. And then it will just return you the actual value underlying it. Um, minor breaks work the same way. And so there's a, an argument called date minor breaks, um, and you can specify it in the same way as date breaks. Um, and as you might have guessed, date minor breaks also has another way of specifying that is to go into the minor breaks argument and then just do another uh, like breaks, like generator or like breaks function. Um, and so you're creating a break algorithm that breaks for every one week, and then that will be your minor break. Um, and I think the book makes some note about like how the minor breaks don't align with the major breaks here because like weeks and months don't align. Like not every month or you don't have all month aren't 28 days. Uh, and so you don't get that like nice convergence uh, at each major tick mark. Um, but that's kind of, I guess, what you have to live with if you're working with date time. Um, and then labels, um, I guess labels is like pretty straightforward, but you just have to know like the, um, like date time special regexes for uh, formatting dates in different ways. So if you've seen a bunch of like percent %y or percent %m, percent %d, percent %y, uh, those pluck out um, and format specific values from the date or date time object. Um, except in this case, uh, I think there's some, uh, are there any helpers? Oh yeah, this one. Uh, so, so this is like the kind of classic example of formatting dates. Um, and so scale X date again, which is kind of the scale we use for date time variables, um, can have this argument called date labels. Um, and percent Y is like pulling out the year data in the format where you only get the last two digits of the year. And so you get like 1970, 1975, presumably 1900s, but 70, 75, 80, 85, whereas before you would have like the full date. Um, and so you can change the labels that way. Um, and again, you can also do labels equals like labels underscore date. Um, and I think there's like a function like that as well. Um, but this one I didn't know about before that I think is very like convenient. Uh, there's this function called label date short, which like just kind of does this job for you. Um, so it kind of just calculates like the minimal amount of precision you need uh, to distinguish between the breaks. And so here, you know, years are sufficient. Um, but then in the case where the data ranges from like 2004 to 2005, then you presumably want to specify the month and then just show like when the January's um, occur twice, then you want to just say like this one's the January from 2004, this is the January uh, on 2005. Um, and so that's the kind of output that label date short provides. And I think this is very convenient. Um, and that's, I think, all there is to date time. Um, kind of like what we saw, it's extension of the functions we saw. Um, and I don't personally work with date or date time objects, so I didn't really do too much exploring. Uh, but yeah, this is what we have. Um, thoughts on this part? Otherwise, I have, uh, I've tried to talk or put in some, a little bit more content for talking about transformations. Um, and I do really urge you to listen to that, the um, RCDO conference talk uh, from last year, uh, talking about the scales package, because um, I think that really like, you know, changed the way I think about how scales and ggplot work. 
Um, there's a lot of neat convenience functions that I didn't know existed that I kind of reinvented the wheels for uh, multiple times over the years. Um, and so, yeah, um, and transformation is like one of those things that um, I was really happy to learn more about because that oftentimes just like kind of happens under the hood and you don't really get to see that. Uh, so I had one more small section on this somewhere past this point. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, so the, so the book talks about how if you have transformations and, and again, transformations are just for continuous data. So they're just like functions that take inputs and outputs that take the raw data and then transform it as like one of the very first steps um, that ggplot does internally. Um, and so if you look at the page for um, like GG proto classes, which is where you're gonna get all of this detail about what happens under the hood. Um, there's a section when it talks about the scales GG proto, um, which says that the, you know, uh, the transformation occurs before the status calculated. So this is just like a nice confirmation from the documentation uh, that if you have, if you're transforming your data, then that's before you're calculating things like, you know, the, the, the like lines from the box plots or, um, you know, the, the heat maps or whatnot. Um, yeah, and this is just another thing to uh, drill the point home about how transformation changes the data that the uh, layer or the ggplot uses um, for like other processes down the line. Um, and so this is just like a, uh, uh, this is a data that was first defined in earlier in this section of the chapter. Um, but we're just plotting like this discrete variable txt here, which is just letters a, b, c, d, um, and then there's like a continuous variable called big, uh, which is which just values thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand. Uh, we can apply a transformation uh, with something like scale x reverse. And again, from last week, we saw that scale x reverse is basically just scale x continuous. But then there's an argument called trans inside scale continuous functions where you can set different kinds of transformers. Um, and scale x reverse is just scale x continuous with trans equals reverse trans. So that's the reverse transformer. And I'm gonna show that um, explicit syntax in a bit. But essentially this does this kind of calculation or transformation of the data um, where you now have the, um, this point associated with like D here um, that has this high value of 4,000 coming up at the front and then the X values are decreasing as you go to the right, which is what you would expect from a reverse scale. Um, if you, and if you go look into the layer data, you'll actually see this transformation being reflected. Um, and so these are, these are like the positional scales um, that you end up with such that uh, this is actually, uh, for group one, you're at minus 1,000, minus 2,000, minus 3,000, minus 4,000. So like this makes sense if you think about X as kind of the, the information that gets shift off to the rendering system, right? Like the rendering system doesn't care like what these are labeled as. It just needs to know that this point comes towards the you know, bottom left corner or at least towards the left corner, this comes towards the right corner. And in like the graphical coordinate system, you go from zero to one or like you know, zero to some positive number. Um, and so like this, is a way of like representing the fact that the, the big value comes to the left because they're, they just have a lower value. Um, and so this, this transformation is applied and then this is the information that uh, gets shipped off to like the rendering part of ggplot internals um, or the thing that you would, to, to like put it formally, this is the um, data that's received by ggplot built or, or not ggplot built, to ggplot gtable, um, which is the next thing that happens after ggplot build. Um, and you can see that in the print method for ggplot. Um, and I won't go into that too deeply, uh, but here's the reverse trans transformer again. Um, if you call the function, it returns the, like this is again, kind of like a function factory. It returns you um, an object that has a bunch of different methods um, that are called internally. And so reverse trans is, um, or if you just call reverse trans without any arguments, that just, creates a transformer that reverses the scale, um, reverses the values and has some other things that go along with it. Um, but essentially what you'll see is like 
this function reverse trans from the scales package is essentially just creating a new transformer object with this trans new function that we saw last week. Um, and this is a way that we can create new transformers. And if you want to mix and match different um, parts of uh, transformations, like if you want to have like log scale, but also reverse, then trans new is a function that you would use to create those kinds of custom transformer objects. Um, and we also saw that like earlier, it's earlier somewhere in 10.1. Um, actually, I'm not sure if the pull request got merged yet, uh, but yeah. Um, so, and then scales also uses that internally as we see here. Um, and again, this just emphasizes the fact that transformers are just a list of functions. They're objects with methods. Um, and so reverse trans has uh, a name and it has a function that transforms the data. It has a function that um, inverses or, or reverts that transformation. Um, it has functions for setting breaks and uh, minor breaks and for formatting the labels. Um, and for setting the domains, um, which are like the range of what it accepts. Um, and so like, for example, for logs, the domain is positive. Uh, for, you know, very simple transformations like reverse, uh, it's just any number it can work with. Um, and as you might expect, like the transform function, the inverse function for reverse is just function x return minus x, um, which like makes sense, which is also why you get this here, because it's been transformed with the, you know, uh, revert the signs uh, function, which is part of the reverse trans object. Um, and yeah, we saw that here. We see that here. So reverse trans is like a list of functions, um, which is essentially the simplified way of saying it's an object with methods. Um, there's a list of functions. You can subset a method from it and then call it like a function. So the transform method of the reverse trans transformer um, can take the, the column values from this the big column inside our toy data set. And then the transformation just returns us the, you know, minus or the negative, the, the other sign of that. So it's positive, it's now negative. And then if you apply the inverse to the transformed raw data, then you just get back the same thing as the raw data. And then if you uh, calculate the breaks from the range of the data and then apply the formatting, uh, this is kind of like the labels underscore function, but it's like embedded as part of the transformer in this case. Um, then you would get back like character labels, which are the actual ones that are going to be used for the plot. Um, yeah, so this is like a little bit of the internals of the trans um, transformer object. And again, you can kind of play around with it with the trans new argument. Um, yeah. And the, uh, the talk from RStudio Comp talks uh, more about that or go, goes more in depth to that. Um, yeah, and transformations, one of the, uh, this, I only realized this after my presentation last week, but the, one of the um, biggest places where transformations get used, but you still don't recognize it as such because it just, you know, just exists under the hood um, is for date time. Um, because date times um, are not like transparently uh, like continuous um, in the sense that like uh, we don't often think of date times as internally just like an integer, like just like a just like a numeric vector with like really big numbers which counts like the seconds from the epoch. Um, and so uh, what you'll see is if you use like date scale or scale x date and stuff like that, then it will internally use uh, this transformer called time transformer. I accidentally clicked the page for it. Um, the time transformer, essentially the transform function of that just grabs the, there we go. Um, the transform function of the times trans transformer, the time transformer um, can take like date objects and then uh, convert them into like numeric or into integer, uh, which like is the kind of thing that the coordinate system can work with. Um, and then the inverse of that just returns us the, the date objects or, or date time objects. Um, and then the format method of this object by default um, can format them according to uh, the hours because these all share the same base. So 
the format function is being smart and is like the, the lowest unit that I need to disambiguate between these breaks are at the unit of hour. Um, and then you'll also see that if you uh, have a data frame that includes data about uh, a daytime variable, you plot it along X, give it some random Y, uh, plot a point, um, and then just throw that and inspect the layer data that comes after the data transformation pipeline, then you'll see that the X values are actually just you know, integer values. Um, and again, this is a kind of information that gets shipped off to uh, the like rendering system. And then it then uses this kind of data uh, to position uh, elements around and make like points and polygons and whatnot. Uh, yeah, that's that for transformation. And I think actually that's all I have. <laughs> um, I actually realized when I said like the book has a, a, a chapter on, I said last time that there's a section called 10.1.1 limits that like doesn't exist. And then there's like 10.5, which is like entirely about limits. Um, I realized that like, this is essentially, they, they, they actually moved this out and made it its own section, um, but then they just forgot to like get rid of this subsection. Um, and I think like the intent was that they would actually introduce this sooner because they talk about limits in all these other sections, but they don't talk about other things in this section. Um, and so, yeah, there was actually nothing to cover for here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all. Okay, so I can introduce um, chapter 11. I didn't completely complete it, but I have a little bit mm -hmm. of stuff I can share. So I'll screen share. Um, let's see. Oh, one Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna be doing, um, it's actually chapter 11, but yeah, here it says chapter nine, color scales and legends, and the learning objectives are to learn how to map values to colors in ggplot2, and learn about color theories, and a more detailed exposition is available at this website. I'll go there in a second. And so it starts off with a little bit about color theory, and it starts off mentioning, um, I think there's the colors where it's like, uh, I forgot what you call them. It's like the, I think it's like RBG, I guess. It's like, I think it's red, blue, and green, I think. But yeah, so basically they use a different scale here. They call it um, HCL, and that stands for hue, chroma, and luminance. Um, so yeah, there have been many attempts to come up with color spaces that are more perceptually uniform. And we'll use a modern attempt called HCL color space, which has three, component, three components of hue, chroma, and luminance. Um, hue ranges from zero to 36, it's an angle, and it gives the color of the color, blue, red, orange, etc. cetera. Um, the chroma is the purity of the color, ranging from zero, which would be gray, to a maximum that varies with luminance. Um, and then the luminance is the lightness of the color, ranging from zero, which would be black, to one, which would be white. An additional complication is that many people, approximately 10% of men, do not possess the normal complement of color receptors and so cannot distinguish, so can distinguish fewer colors than usual. Um, so they're saying it's best to avoid red and green contrast um, because people who are like colorblind aren't able to easily differentiate between those two. Um, so yeah, it has a link for VisiCheck, um, which is an on online solution where you can. Um, check to see like uh or basically you get to simulate how like whether like a website or an image how it would look to someone who is colorblind and then another another alternative is the dichromat package 34 which provides tools for simulating colorblindness and a set of color schemes known to work well for colorblind people you can also help people with colorblindness in the same way that you can help people with black and white printers by providing redundant mappings to aesthetics like size, line, or type. Okay, yeah, I didn't jump that far. Uh, let me go back. All right, so, okay, so this one is the visit chat. I didn't get to fully play around with it, but I, yeah, I was checking out the website. Um, so yeah, it's a way of showing what things look like for someone who is colorblind. 
and you can try VisiCheck online. Either run it um, or VisCheck on your own image files or run VisCheck on a website page. And you can download programs to let it run on your own computer. Um, yeah, saying that roughly one in 20 people have some sort of television deficiency and the world looks different to them. And then also, yeah. yeah. So also um, they mentioned the dichromat, um, dichromat package. And I looked at it because I wasn't sure what that meant, but um, it means to have only two functioning sets of cone cells rather than the three that most people have. So that um, basically it's also what color blindness is. Um, let me go to my our studio. You guys can still see my, you guys can still see the R Studio, right? Oh no, you can't see the R Studio. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay, you can see it now. Okay. All right. Um. So yeah. So I just looked in the help where it um, brings up Dichromat, um, the colorblind palette, and honestly, I'm still kind of learning how to use these help functions, but um. Here, like the arguments for name of the color palette um, and examples it requires. But yeah, basically this package, I haven't played around with how to actually call it, um, like when I use it, but yeah, it would allow you to use um, color palettes that are digitally perceptible for people who have color blindness. And right, I had another page that I wanted to show. Um, can you see my Safari page? No, okay. I guess I need to screen share everything. Safari. Sorry about that. Okay, so actually a couple of days ago, um, let me see. Yeah, a couple of days ago, this gentleman, Blake Robert Mills, he announced that he has a, um, He's launching a color palette for um, our studio called Matt Brewer. And it's based on like um, different pieces that are, you can find in the Met. And I just thought it was like really pretty. <laughs> it was like perfect timing with when I found it. So yeah, the color schemes are based on um, these different um, pieces of art that he found in the Met Museum in New York. So yeah, and they're just kind of really pretty. Um, yeah, I really liked it. So when I present next week, I want to kind of go a bit more into these. And um, yeah, and the talk, the book also talks more about. Um, I want to say brewers, but brewers is a package in itself. Um, but yeah, they're really pretty, and you can actually find it on his um, GitHub. He has more information. Yeah, how the palettes are inspired by works at the Metropolitan Museum of art in New York. Um, yeah, and it's just, yeah, they're just so pretty. <laughs> I don't know. And then also if you go down to the bottom, so I think I saw someone had a color at the bottom. I know a few people had mentioned, like in the thread, mentioning or asking him rather whether any of the color schemes are good for people who have color blindness. And um, so yeah, he has it that you can like call to see which packages will work well for people that are colorblind. And let's see that. Okay. So let me oh and also back to back to um what they were mentioning about the Q chroma and luminance. Um, this is actually one of the links that was already on the book, and it's kind of a way to visualize, like how they how hue, chroma, and luminance um, kind of interact with one another. So, like he said, like the hue is like an angle when, in the circle, and also they were saying like it's kind of it's like a three D space. So it's not um, like how to visualize it is like a three D kind of space. So the hue is like the angle going around the circle. And the chroma um, goes from like the middle out. So for example, um, like pink from what I understand, like pink would be like a chroma of red. Um, 
because it has like, um, I guess because it has like more of the white in it. And then the luminance, where it says lightness, that will be the same of the luminance. Um, yeah, where it goes from being, I think they said the middle is the gray. And then, yeah, so it basically goes from black to white. And it's kind of like how bright the color is. So like pink is kind of like a shade of red or it's a chroma of red. And then you can have different like luminance of pink itself kind of thing. What else do I have? So, and there are a couple other um, things that come up a bit later. Yeah. Oh, someone. Oh, thank you, Jane. I just saw this. I'm going to click on it for two ways, please. Ah, oh, that's, you guys can see that, right? It's basically like, for example, like yellow can get only, only get so dark perceptually, which is why it peaks out only a little bit from the center. But for example, red can get very bright perceptually. So the brightest red is brighter than the brightest yellow is like the kind of the idea here with the squishing. If you don't have the squish and it's just the perfect cylinder, that's HSV, um, Q saturation value. And that's like the older version of HCL, which is hue chroma luminance. Um, and ACL is more, has more perceptual correspondence or better one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, this is my, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of all I have for now because I want to be able to kind of go a bit more in depth in it and not kind of, yeah. But, so that's what's left to come next week, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Did anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you both, so. June and Lydia. Thank you. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, looking forward to next week. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully, well, actually, we're meeting on the third. So, because next week, that Monday, I think it's like two days after Christmas. So, oh. we're meeting, <laughs> I'm presenting on January 3rd. Yeah. Okay. Next week, no meeting. Yeah, no, no meeting. Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank Everybody. You. Happy, Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs>